Good morning and welcome to Political Live. My name is Aitor Hernandez Morales and I'm a reporter on Political Europe's Energy and Climate Desk. This morning we are uh, moving on to this next session of the Sustainability Summit and talking about the green transition, which has been touted as a grand opportunity for Europeans to eventually move on to a cleaner and uh, better uh, Europe, a, a Europe that guarantees a better quality of life in a more sustainable block. Now, the road to that brighter future is complex. And uh, it has been fully recognized that a part of the struggle will be phasing out Europe's carbon heavy jobs and making sure that the workers currently employed by these sectors have an opportunity and have their space in the new Europe that we're trying to build. Uh, and this obviously extends to the regions where they live, some of which are expected to be very, very hard hit by this transition. So last December, Brussels formally approved the Just Transition Fund, which was the von der Leyen Commission's signature scheme to address this issue. One year later, we've gathered a expert uh, group of panelists to discuss the state of play in this key part of the Green Deal and the wider climate transition. And we are gathering to ask the question, how inclusive is the switch to the cleaner future turning out to be. Uh, with me to discuss this thrilling topic this morning uh, here in Brussels, we've got Adam Giburge Cetvertensky, whose name I can have effectively butchered. Uh, he's the Deputy Minister from the Ministry of Climate and Environment of Poland. Then we've got joining us online German NEP Nicholas Ninas. He uh, is a member of the Greens. We've got Samantha Smith, Director of the Just Transition Center, and Georgios Stasis, Chairman and CEO of Greece's Public Power Corporation. Welcome to you all. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind our audience that you can also participate in this debate by sending in questions via the Swap Card platform. Uh, and you can also tweet with the hashtag Politico Sustainability. That's hashtag Politico Sustainability. So uh, starting off and kind of picking up the thread from where we left it last year, I want to go directly to uh, Nicholas, since you were one of the key figures in Parliament uh, when the Just Transition Fund was being negotiated and, uh, and making its way uh, through the legislative process. Uh, you very much helped to shape that scheme. So one year on, what's happening with it? Where are we at? Um, we are still in a very weird phase where the regions are still figuring out how to use the funding uh, the best way. And there we already see the first problems. As you know, um, we intended this, uh, this scheme to help the regions and help the people uh, and give the people the possibility to help themselves. We don't or we didn't want to invest too much into uh, old and failing and big corporations uh, to give them a handout money in big numbers uh, to just um, save jobs for a few years just to be taken away um, after the time anyway. Uh, instead, we wanted to give money, especially to local communities, um, to the people uh, and, and giving the possibility to have a bottom up approach in which you can actually uh, see how changes is made and where people can have their own view on how to change. The problem that we're stumbling across at the moment is especially with this programming. The regions are trying to figure out how to use the money the best. And one of the big problems that we have there, for example, is actually the excessive amounts of money that we, needs to be spent in a very short amount of time. For example, uh, we have the Next Generation Youth uh, Fund that um, needs to be where the money needs to be spent within the next two years. And that's the majority of the funding for the regions. And so there are regions that have to spend 300 million euros in two years. And doing that from a bottom-up approach is quite hard. So what they're trying to do at the moment is to just take the money and throw it uh, towards a single project and have like a single project with a lot of funding. Um, and that is, I believe, uh, the wrong way to go because it does not involve the people enough, but really sends on short uh, term solutions or not solutions, but short term ideas instead of long term sustainable solutions for the regions. So if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly, you're, you're saying that one of the main issues is that, that it's essentially being rushed and that it's uh, being rushed into big projects that may not actually be the most suitable for the, for the affected regions? 
Uh, yes, exactly. It is uh, it is rushed, and the the politicians and the planning and the managing authorities, of course, are then in the problem that they uh, that they need to spend and want to spend uh, the money fast, but don't know how to spend it the the most efficient way, and therefore use it for um, bigger corporations. And there, then we come into a big uh, dilemma um, that is also, you know, in a certain way, um, um, programmed from the start. You know, we tried during the whole negotiation to keep big investments in single companies out of the picture, to mm. stop investments in coal, in gas, in fossil fuels in general, in nuclear as well. And um, we had, of course, very strong lobbying from those big companies, from those uh, supporters of fossil fuels, to um, to have the Just Transition Fund as a matter to invest in these failing companies and in their failing business model. And as such, you know, today you named this this panel um, the going beyond the PR scheme uh, or the PR stunt. And for that, for this uh, Sustainable Future Summit, I think it's important to know that one of the sponsors is CEFIC, which is exactly the problem here because they are a conglomerate of the biggest um, of the biggest European chemical industry trees, including fossil fuel producers like BP, ExxonMobil, Total, Shell, uh, Chevron, and they are paying um, in order to lobby, in order to ensure that they get funding, even though they um, have uh, all these companies themselves include 10% of the um, global CO2 emissions, uh, just these companies that are sponsoring your panel today or our panel today. And so I think it's highly troubling when we look at this and um, when we know that they are trying to finance more um, PR stunts rather than doing changes, um, because we know that only 0.2% of their budget really goes to reduce the amount of um, carbon dioxide spending. Um, and on the other hand, they're trying to really lobby us as politicians. That's the pressure that we felt during the negotiation with the Just Transition Fund um, and uh, the, the Brussels bubble in general with, uh, with sponsoring um, events like these and trying to take away the, uh, the the debate when the real problem is that they are hurting the environment and at the same time want to be paid for stopping to do that. And that's just insane. And so I think we need to shed a light on that as well um, and, uh, uh, and, and go into that when we talk about stopping the PR stunt. All right. Uh, Adam, you over here. Uh, so your country is slated to receive the largest share of the Just Transition Fund. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, on what Nicholas was saying. Are you, are you also finding pressure to, to get the money through very, very quickly? And is that, is that affecting the process? Well, I, I think I would agree with some and, and, and you and some of the, the things that, that Nicholas said. I think one, one of the, 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 the things that is, um, that is uh, true about the, the projects is that we need to have good quality projects in the fund. And we want to have projects that will really create new jobs in those regions. That's really the, the aim of that, uh, of that fund is to create a job in those regions. Sometimes when we, when we discuss uh, with different stakeholders in this, in this process, I have a feeling that some are thinking of this fund as um, something to deal with leftover of cohesion policy. We did not manage to get these projects realized in, 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 in cohesion policy, so let's do it with, with the Just Transition Fund. It's not really what it's about. We really want these funds to be used to, to create jobs. Uh, about the size of the, the, the funds, you know, and, and the example of the uh, um, uh, recovery and resilience facility is a, is a good one because we had this discussion internally and I was discussing, discussing with my colleagues and I was telling them, you know, you can give me the entire Polish allocation and that wouldn't be sufficient for me to deal with our cleaner program and to change the three million uh, coal boilers that we have to change in all the Polish houses. Mm. So I think, I think in terms of size, uh, it's, really, it's, it's really not that, that, not that much. And that, that, that uh, tr just transition fund is really, uh, is really uh, several times smaller than the, uh, than, than the allocation in the, uh, in the recovery and resilience facility. So yes, we need good quality uh, uh, projects. Uh, but I don't think that it's, uh, it's that uh, uh, much uh, of, a, of an amount and that much of a, of a challenge to, uh, to use these, uh, these resources. And on the comment on, on big companies, I think we, we will see a bias in the, in, the, in the territorial plans we will see because the, the legislation requires regions to disclose uh, ahead um, those uh, investments that will be carried out by, by big companies. They need to be included in the plans. The, 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 those that will, the projects that will be done by small companies, they don't need to be included in the plans. So 
it's, it's, it's meant to be like, like this, that it's, it's, these plants are meant to show more big projects. It doesn't mean, at least in the Polish case, mm -hmm. we want to have an indicative list. It's basically projects that could get financed. It's not a project that will get financed, but because we have to disclose the projects done by big companies, there will be more big companies on this list because that's the, that's the requirement of the, of the legislation. But that doesn't mean that in the end, all these projects will be financed. Okay. Okay, uh, Samantha, I want to bring Sorry, you in here. Uh, yes, Nicholas. Sorry, I just wanted me to correct a, a point that Emma, Adam made there. Uh, it's, I hope it's okay that I say your first name and not your last, because I will have problems just yes, to say that, yeah, that's that's why my first name is so simple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, so um, uh, it's if you look in the in the possibilities of funding in here, it's definitely not just about creating jobs. That's very important to distinguish. It is this whole project is meant to ensure that the regions stay liv livable and vibrant. And that is, of course, in a big chunk also due to good jobs, good paying, uh, stable, secure and sustainable jobs. But also it's about the question how we earn and harness energy in the future, how to make culture a driver, how to ensure that the regions um, have um, social credibility, that you can, that you have a social infrastructure. All those parts are still uh, fundable and should be funded with the Just, Just Transition Fund. To only focus on jobs is going in the wrong direction because you need not to, to ensure just jobs, but to, you need to ensure a general um, approach for a good living regions. And that's something that I see also uh, regions or uh, like like um, Adam just mentioned, uh, speaking for the Polish side, may, maybe underestimate currently and uh, did not completely fulfill in the pro prospect what we intended. Adam, any any uh, response to that? Well, I think I think obviously yes, culture is an important part of making the, these regions uh, um, attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, but but people will not be living there if they don't have jobs. Don't have so jobs. I think we we obviously need both. Huh? Mm -hmm. Uh, Sam, I want to I want to pull you into this uh, this uh, conversation, and maybe from a from a broader perspective, not just limiting ourselves to the to the to the EU's uh, just transition fund. What are your thoughts in general about how countries are doing to to uh, to address this issue, especially on the matter of social dialogue? Is there enough of that going on, and and in what direction is it moving? Yeah, no, yeah, thanks yeah, so thanks much. So well, um, first of all, I should just say that I work for the International Trade Union Confederation. Mm -hmm. So we represent 200 million organized workers in 162 countries. So I will be giving you a perspective from the people who are um, whose jobs are most at risk or who are hoping to get new jobs. I think that, uh, you know, the first point is that, in fact, it is about jobs because we're still in a pandemic. We're short about 200 million organized or formal jobs globally uh, through the course of the pandemic. And then we have many more jobs that are at risk and we may be going into another sort of major wave of the pandemic where more people will become unemployed. So it is 100% about jobs right now. Um, and everything else is important, but unless people are able to get back to work, unless they have decent social protection in this period, um, unless they can pay their, their utility bills, keep their homes warm during the winter, everything else is gonna be a kind of second priority. So from our perspective, it's really important that the EU, um, first with the Fit for 55 package and with the Just Transition Mechanism and Fund and the other funds that will be mobilized to support Just Transition, that this goes really well. Why? Because Just Transition is actually a global concept uh, developed by the trade union movement. We have UN rules for Just Transition through the International Labor Organization, countries, governments, employers and unions all around the world are trying to implement a just transition. And we're also looking to Europe as the place that is furthest along in terms of policy architecture, but also resources. So, um, so it's, not, it's not that just transition is you know, something that's only happening in Europe or only a European uh, preoccupation. Everyone is working on this issue because it's really urgent to get down emissions, but also to create new good jobs, to maintain good jobs, and to make sure that people have the safety net that they need during this period. You asked about social dialogue specifically. I mean, just to 
unpack that a little bit for the audience. You know, social dialogue sounds very nice, but this is actually like the formal process of industrial relations and tripartism between employers, governments, and unions. And it is a pillar of the Just Transition Fund, as we've heard from the senior vice president, senior vice president Timmermans many times, as well as others, the leadership of the EU and some of the national governments. What the European Trade Union Confederation has found, they have done a survey of unions across Europe to find out what is happening with social dialogue. Is that it's pretty intermittent in practice. Um, the trade unions who have a right to sometimes a contractual right to be consulted about what happens with our jobs, to be not only consulted, but to be in negotiations, to have a say in what the future looks like that in some countries, governments are hiring consultants who are having a sort of mass you know, hearings or engagement processes. Sometimes trade unions are not in involved at all. So this is a big gap. It's not only a gap in terms of what has been committed to on the policies, but it's also a gap if the idea is that people are going to um, agree to a plan that is about them, but is made without any involvement by them and where they're going to either have very big changes in their jobs or even potentially to lose their jobs. So this is, if we want this broad social acceptance, then it had for Fit for 55, for ambitious climate policies in any part of the world, people have to accept it and want it to happen and see that it's gonna be good for them and their families. And that means it has to speak to people's core concerns. And if you ask people right now in high carbon regions, what are your core concerns? Jobs, hmm. paying the heating bill, having a future for yourselves and your families. So we need enough resources beyond the Just Transition Fund. We need a uh, a good understanding of what the actual employment impacts of these changes are going to be, because we don't even have that in some regions. And we also need to have a real on the ground commitment to social dialogue and to not only consulting, but negotiating with trade unions and with workers in order to get these plans. Samantha, let me just ask you briefly because I, I want to I want to go on to Georgos and, and give him a shot as well. But uh, you were you were mentioning that that, uh, that the EU is kind of on the forefront of this of this process. Is there any country that you would that you would highlight as a as a particularly good example of of uh, of this process? Is there is there any country that stands out in your mind as as a, an example to follow? Within the EU, mm -hmm. or just in the Un un you know. unless you also want to point us to a global leader, we're we're, we're fine with that as well. <laughs> Well, I'm, I, I think I, I think I'll do both. I mean, yeah. we're about to get a, a national law on just transition in Canada. Canada mm -hmm. was actually first out of the box with a national process on just transition, led by trade unions. We actually called for that process, and uh, we're deeply involved in it. And now the government is, we hope, going to deliver a law, but also investments in the Canada's high carbon provinces that are going to enable people to transition have good jobs, have modern infrastructure. Um, beyond that, as a lot of people know, South Africa is also engaging in a process of, or embarking on a process of just transition in the power and mining sector. Mm -hmm. I think there, the big issue is not about policies or uh, good structures. It is actually about jobs because South Africa has 44% unemployment. So I think in, in the EU, you know, the German coal compromise was a very good agreement for a few reasons. No one was left behind. There was investment in the regions in modern infrastructure, which is what you need in order to make regions good places to live and stay. And there was also a focus on making sure that a transition to clean energy didn't burden poor and working class households and also kept German energy prices competitive for industry. So now we're going to, you know, see if that process can be accelerated. And right. In that sense, it's a very exciting moment. Yeah, yeah, it's quite a, it's quite a challenge having that, uh, that deadline moved up now to, to, uh, to 2030. Uh, Georgos, I want to, I want to bring you in uh, as the, as the, as the, as the 
company voice on, on the panel. Uh, you, of course, head uh, PPC, which is Greece's largest electric uh, power company. And for several years now, you guys have been working on decarbonization. How are you addressing the just transition concerns in that process? How are you making sure that workers aren't left behind? Well, thank you and, and greetings to everybody else. Uh, thank you for hosting us today. Uh, we, I mean, in, in the last two and a half years, we have uh, put together a new business plan, uh, and this business plan is targeting this energy transition. I mean, uh, what I, I would like to, to point out of this is that, I mean, the first step is to acknowledge the issue, is to have an acknowledgement that you need to act and you need to go to a, to a different plan. I mean, if you look at the GDP of Western Macedonia, uh, which is the local prefecture in Greece with coal, it was continuously degrading year by year in the last 10, 15 years. Um, so it was clear that we need to take another, another step. Uh, in PPC, we started this new strategy, looking at this energy transition. We put together uh, the, the most advanced, the, most, uh, uh, the, the biggest phase-out plan for, for Lignite in, in Europe. We are phasing out Lignite by 2023, all operating assets. And in parallel, we are investing very much in renewables. We are not exiting this, this area. We will be wearing that area and we will continue being in that area. Uh, we are just going to change the profile of our investments, and not only renewables. We will do solar, a lot of solar, but we are, we are considering doing waste to energy. We are considering of doing a biomass. We are considering of changing our old model, our old power plants to ancillary services. Uh, and, and this is our part. SPPC on reinvesting in that, in that uh, area and uh, of course um, uh, uh, changing also the skills and of, of, of the workers who need to, to stay with us in, in the following years. Then we have also the state who is doing their part uh, on, the, uh, on the areas and the lands that we're not going to use. They are going to do uh, much more investments using the Just Transition Funds and RRF money, which is also helping very much. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that, I mean, we have a plan today that we, we didn't have in the past. Now we have a plan. It's very analytical. Uh, it gives a lot of enthusiasm in, in the people. Uh, we have a very analytical uh, task list. Um, and, and the people are contributing in different ways. I mean, uh, um, take the example of our solar investments. We have allowed 5% uh, of these investments to be contributed by the people who live there. So they are co-investing with us. Uh, participating, sharing the value of what we're trying to do. Uh, we are uh, investing in, in uh, identifying the skills gap and using other EU funds to, to retrain the people and put them back in, 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 in jobs in this transition. And, and many other industries are joining in the areas and the lands that we are not going to use. New industries will be created, touristic uses. So out of this, I think there is a very positive angle that we need to have in mind. Uh, that, the, that the prosperity of the general area uh, will be improved down the line if there is a, an analytical plan uh, like the one we have in Greece and we are uh, firmly uh, following. Lovely. Adam, I want to turn back to you and, and speak to your country's specific uh, situation. You guys are currently working with the 2049 coal phase out, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I want to hear a little bit more about what it's like on the ground there when you take on uh, something as complex as the just transition and especially having such a historic and, a, and powerful mining sector. Is part of this communication with the very workers that you're, that you're trying to, to, uh, to switch over? And what's been the reception? What's, what is, what's that conversation like? Well, it has been a very difficult uh, discussion that, that my colleagues from the, the, the Ministry of State has, Assets have been con conducting with, uh, with the trade unions over the past, the past years, and it led to, to disagreement that was signed with the, with the trade unions um, to, uh, to shut down uh, uh, the last coal mine in, in 2049, as you said. And, um, and, and it is pretty much, as, as in the German case, also going together with uh, um, investments uh, uh, for the for for the region, and that's a, a complex um, uh, attempt to, uh, to 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 provide these regions with a, with a perspective uh, for future development. And I think, really, as as was said, said earlier, also by by Samantha, the um, the just transition is really a, a prerequisite for our for the success of our climate policy. And I think this has been really a, a big change over the past few years. And uh, we, we, we started and, and working also with the, with the trade unions when we had the presidency of the, the COP in, in Katowice and we proposed a, a global uh, a declaration which was joined by 55 countries, which shows that this is a challenge that is 
going well beyond the, just the EU, and it's, it's really touching a, a lot of countries across, across the globe, how to make sure that the, that the policy we, we conduct is not uh, perce perceived as a, a threat for, uh, for major parts of the, of the society. And this is the, the, the aim of the, uh, of the Just Transition Fund or other instruments that we implement. And they are critical to the success of our, of our uh, climate policy. If I think of the Polish case, to answer more fully your, your question, I would say that probably the second biggest challenge is, um, is the investments themselves. Um, because we have uh, today a huge fleet of, um, of uh, coal uh, um, power plants. And the question is, are we going to be able to, to build fast enough uh, the, uh, the, the new capacity we need to, uh, to, to shut down these, these coal power plants? And obviously, you will, you will need a mix. And we have presented a, a policy uh, at, uh, at Polish level uh, relying on, on new zero emission energy sources uh, to, to provide uh, um, um, a mix that works uh, uh, in sync with, uh, with our climate ne neutrality objective at EU level. Um, but really synchronizing these investments with uh, the withdrawal of the existing fill fleet will be a, a huge challenge as well. Okay. Uh, Nicholas, I, I want to turn back to you uh, and, and just ask you... Uh, very directly, you're, you're, you're one of the, of the architects of, uh, of the Just Transition Fund within the parliament. Uh, and, and so certainly this is an initiative that you strongly believe in. But in, in terms of the greater green transition, do we need to accept that some, some regions, some people will inevitably be left behind? No. I think that is a political question that we have to, to ask ourselves. Do we want to have... Um, a transition that leaves people behind or not. Mm. And, the, and, and the fact, you know, that's also the part why we are doing the policy that we're doing. We're not warning about climate change um, and warning about that we need to fade out um, uh, um, of coal until 2030, for example, um, because, I don't know, because we hate people or anything. It's the opposite. <laughs> We are afraid that this will hurt us, our economy. And if we're not fading out now, starting now to fade out gradually until 2030, then we will have to have more drastic changes in the future that will hurt the people more. So yeah. with this process that we're starting right now and that we're having right now, with the just transition process, and I have to agree here with Adam, to start with this is very important to show the people we are doing this not because out of thin air or anything, but because we need to and we want to make this process together with you and we want to make sure that nobody is left behind. Because that is a political message. In no region in Europe should people uh, lose their jobs uh, or have no prospect and future um, because of the green transition. The green transition is a tool in which we want to make the world better and not worse. Okay. And if that were to happen in any region, that would be a national failure versus a, a, a European failure? That the, the European programs to address this issue are robust enough? Um, that's, that's a very uh, challenging question. You know, we always said, and I remember that I talked with you and other uh, of your colleagues, uh, and also, of course, of my colleagues, but we publicly announced that the funding prospect that the Commission proposed in the first instance was too little. And then we said what we needed was around 30 billion for the Just Transition Fund, 30 to 35 billion. In the second proposal, we saw that uh, proposed from the Commission because of Next Generation EU. That was a surprise to us, to be honest, that they met the target that we, that we assumed. But it was drawn back. And it was drawn right. back because of the member states. So is it a European failure or is it a failure of the member states? In the end, I think the... the the the, pro, uh, the the European program is not robust enough to be very honest because it's not um, not uh, fit enough. But of course, the question then how to use it on the ground is also one of uh, national uh, impact. And if we see like 80% of the European regions having zero problems or little problems with the transition, and a few having a lot of problems then that is a national, um, uh, a national problem uh, or a national failure. But I assume that we have to reinvest 
into uh, into the just transition fund in the future because again we i said 30 to 35 billion is needed and that's not what we have another point that i want to make is the question of investments mm -hmm. and there has been has been pointed out also by by several speakers before that we need to see more investments from the private side so that we have uh, an, a d different tool uh, called the uh, just transition mechanism that enables private investment supported by the eib i hope that it will function well and it should then and um, trigger down um, investments uh, in the size of around 100 billion euros. But um, we're not certain if it does. And if the taxonomy includes gas, for example, there is no use to especially invest into uh, those just transition regions because um, the, the, the taxonomy would then just be a, a nonsensical tool. And that's also the, the fear that we had with the just transition. Um, uh, with the just transition fund uh, that we include, for example, gas, uh, that would mean, you know, if you now, uh, of course, all my colleagues from 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 uh, Greece or from from Romania or Bulgaria or also Poland are right. It's better to use a a gas boiler uh, than a, a coal boiler. But if we now change from coal to gas, just to change in ten years again from gas to something climate neutral. That's just triggering. That's just asking for more investments. It's just wasting money. Right. And that's what a lot of politicians just want to do at the moment. And what the taxonomy, if we include gas in it, uh, would do as well. Yeah, the aim is to avoid at home stranded assets, basically. <laughs> yeah, we're just basically throwing throwing money out of the window for the next 10 years. Uh, Adam, I'll let you jump in and then I want to switch to Samantha because I, I see Samantha's about to throw something at the at the camera so that we, we, we can bring her into the conversation as well. Uh, go ahead, Adam. No, no I'm, so, I'm so eager to ask then, then uh, within those 10 years, if we don't invest in gas, then it means we continue with coal to back up uh, renewables, right? That's, that's, that's what we should do, right? Nicholas? Yes, sorry, but but yes, the yes. The, the climate the climate um, the climate um, uh, constellation of gas is not better than coal. So it doesn't matter if you use coal or gas; it's bad. Both both of them is bad. So just do it properly in the first run, and don't use the second one to just waste European and taxpayers' money. That just doesn't make any sense. And of course, you're right. You need to use the uh, the existing assets. That's also a problem that we have in Germany. But we know that the that if you want it, politically speaking, you can accelerate the um, the build out of uh, of, um, of renewable sources way way faster than. Uh, it's it's uh, it's being done at the moment. Take I can take Germany as an example because we are too slow with the with the uh, building up of renewable sources. For example, with uh, wind energy. But the reason for that is a political one. The reason for that is because we are not allowing um, uh, wind turbines to be closer than the tenth of its height uh, to to uh, the next uh, houses, which is insane because there's no additional threat. Uh, we are also taking way too long to make sure that it comes through the bureaucratic process. It takes seven years from planning to building just because of bureaucracy. If we want to change that, if we want to accelerate, we can. And the new green government or part green government will show that, hopefully, that we can reduce the time that we need for planning and bureaucracy. And if we do that, also in Poland, uh, you have the possibilities, not just Poland, but all over Europe, we have the possibilities to uh, accelerate the climate um, uh, the climate change movement and the, the renewable energies. And the additional benefit of that, and we had a study um, uh, looking into that, is that the region profit from it. We, we have additional jobs to be created. In my home region, my constituency, Mecklenburg Vorpommern, we, we are talking about just 50,000 additional jobs just from solar and 200 additional jobs just, just from uh, wind energy. That's that's insane amount of jobs. So job creation, first thing. Second of thing uh, would be new tax revenues because we have additional income just from those regions. Uh, and the third uh, thing would, of course, be technology uh, advantage. Everybody in the world is looking at, uh, is, is trying to figure out how to improve wind turbines and solar panels and, of course, uh, storage facilities. If we are acting the fastest, we have something to export to the world. And this is really something where we can accelerate. So to hurdling and to say how oh, it's taking so, so much time and we, we just need to, we need, we need to until 2049 or something, is just um, a waste of energy, it's a waste of taxpayers' money, and it's simply um, letting the, the other competitors in the world taking the step ahead while we wait and look. And that, I think, is bad politics.
Nick, Nicholas, I just I, I I see what Adam did there, and I and I uh, I want to be sure that I understand it because it was a very clever uh, clever way. So uh, from the from the from your point of view, it is preferable to keep coal going, however long it is, until you can switch over to the to the renewable energy source, which you're pointing out. Deployment needs to be much faster. The cash going into it needs to be much faster. But better that than to switch to gas and then switch to renewables, simply because at that point you're just throwing money at something you're going to phase out basically within 10 years' time, right? Well, if Adam has an idea how to spend one euro twice, then you, of course, <laughs> can do it first with gas and then with renewables. But if we're spending, if we're taking, you know, if we have a fixed amount, like let's say uh, the two billion that Poland from the Just Transition Fund gets, uh, and you spend it on gas, then you still have to go from gas to, gas to renewables. Right. So Better why not the you know, take a year longer years. and yeah, and go directly right. towards uh, towards the renewables? So I, th I think I, I think I would agree that that uh, uh, from a climate perspective. Uh, when gas replaces uh, zero emission sources, it's not too clever. That 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 uh, that's a point I, I, I would agree. But I think on the, the, the transition, it's not it's not a dilemma between switching from gas to renewables later on. The, the the use of gas is different. The use of gas is to provide electricity when we don't have electricity from renewables. We did the analysis for for Poland, and we looked at based on the weather patterns that we had in the last, in the last years, we plan, we, our plans are to double our um, uh, renewable energy share in the electricity market to, until 2030 compared to 2020. But if we took the assumption, let's quadruple that. And, and let's assume we, ha we, 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 we manage to move much faster than we anticipate. And still, we have four days in a row where we don't have any production from these renewables. And we have nine days in a row where there is barely any production from these renewables. So for these days, you need some source of production. And if it's not gas, then it's coal, at least until we have a new technology. But that new technology will not be renewables. It may be energy storage. It may be something else that needs to be, to be uh, invented. It may be hydrogen. I don't know what it will be. But it's not something that we have today on the market. So I think that... It's not today, it's not a question about investing this, this euro in either renewables or something else. It's, it's something that you need to back up renewables. And, and what that thing can be is, uh, is, a, is a matter of discussion. But I think that, that you need something to, to provide this energy for, in the Polish case, as I said, it's, it's four days in a row without production from renewables and, and nine days with barely any productions. Well, Adam, you have, I believe, 90% of coal production. So I don't see the problem of, uh, of stability as, as a big problem. If you would have 70% of renewables, of course we need to talk about stability and net security uh, uh, and storage facilities in a different way. Absolutely agree. But that's not the certain as I uh, said, it's point with that, times that Poland and it. also... Yeah, but it, it's, not, it's not a, a problem at the moment. If you spend the next seven years which is the budget that we're talking about for the next seven years. Uh, the project will run around uh, nine years or something. Mm -hmm. um, if you spend that just building up renewable energies, then in, in seven years we can talk about, uh, we can talk about uh, gas again, but I think uh, that, it, that it still won't make sense because we will until then hopefully have um, uh, good um, storage facilities available. Absolutely agree that, there's, that this is a big lack for renewables that we need to fix. I hope especially that uh, our colleagues from the private uh, uh, side can see or can tell us if we, if we see any extents on that. But um, to make ourselves responsible uh, um, uh, reliant on gas, gas from Russia especially, I think shows just in this moment, I mean, why are the, gas, uh, are the prices so high for, for energy and for heating? Because Russia is, uh, is, uh, is using the advantage that we are heavily reliant on gas and is raising the prices. To make ourselves independent from gas makes ourselves independent from Russia as well. And I think that is also a very important point that we need to drive for European households to ensure that there's no reliance on Russia and no reliance on high gas prices during the winter, no matter what a crazy dictator over in the East is doing. I'll, uh, I'll take this moment to uh, just uh, mention to all of you that on Friday we're actually having a panel debate on this, so make sure to tune in on, uh, on our debate on soaring energy prices. Uh, cutting in there, Samantha, let me let, me let you jump in because I, I, I know that you've been uh, waiting to comment for a bit. 
Yeah, I've just been fascinated by this discussion. But uh, just to just to go back to something you said earlier, Nicholas, I mean, no disagreement here that it's important to start the transition now and that the reason to start the transition now also from a trade union perspective, from the perspective of people who are our members or who should be our members, is that if we want them to have a good transition, if we want them to have good jobs on the other end, that takes time and you can't start to, you can't start to plan for that and start to create new jobs one year before the deadline. So we completely agree with that and we completely agree with the intent that it is about people jobs and making sure that we get this done. Um, I, want to, uh, I want to bring up one other, one other issue, which is about this, the importance of planning and institutions between what happens at the EU level and what happens at the member state level. So in Spain, one of the things that the government has done, another example of a successful just transition, a well-managed just transition, is actually that they've established in the government an observatory on just transition with trade unions on the board, mm -hmm. where we are all looking at different sectors across Spain to see where the pinch points for just transition are going to be. That includes the auto sector. So we think that these kinds of institutions, these tripartite institutions with government, with employers, with trade unions, where we try together to look at what employment effects are going to be, where do emissions need to come down next, where are the most jobs affected, which regions will be hardest hit, that these are critically important. On the issue of what should happen next in Poland and coal versus gas, just a sort of broader perspective again. Mm. We're working with unions in the United States, in the state of California, um, and specifically in Southern California, on what it's going to take to transition California's uh, power sector to as close to 100% renewables and clean energy as you can get. And one of the conclusions is, is just as everyone's saying, you need something, whether it's going to be Hydrogen, which is what we're focusing on and where we see huge interest in the potential for hydrogen and energy storage. Um, some other form of energy storage, not clear. But if you really want to make this transition, you actually do have to have this backup capacity in the system. And that has to be the kind of backup capacity that is going to get you to a very low emission system. You're we're not I, investing I, you, enough oh, in the sorry, power sector. Yeah, we're not in that, what we see right now in the energy crisis, not only in Europe, but in different, mm -hmm. different countries. We're not investing enough in secure, clean, affordable, reliable energy if we want to make this transition. That's another huge point. We need investments, investments that create good jobs with labor standards. Georgos, if we can, if we can bring you in, and, and I'm, yeah. I'm sorry that we're, we're running so short, I wanted, but I, if, I wanted to make a yeah, let's bring you in. That. I mean, uh, hearing Nicholas a while ago, I, I tend to agree with him in the sense that I mean, when we're looking at the residential sector, I mean, it, it's really pointless to, to, to and meaningless to, to invest in uh, gas distribution networks and uh, remove coal heaters with gas heaters. Uh, it really makes no sense for the transition we want to make when we can promote uh, promote much more the, the heat pumps. Uh, with, uh, and, and electrification, simply because electrifying our, our industry uh, is, is easier to because of the decarbonization we can achieve with renewables. So then again, uh, it, it's never about a matter of going back to what was discussed about funds. I don't believe funding is an issue for our industry. There are a lot of funds uh, available to be invested, uh, waiting to, for the rules of the game to be cleared. I mean, uh, permitting is an issue. Um, uh, regulations is an issue. These kind of things we need to clarify in order to release investments uh, much more. Uh, so, uh, of course, um, mo removing coal and uh, adding more and more and more renewables will add more intermediacy from renewable storage that will be needed. And we need to start thinking about combining renewables with batteries and making um, uh, promoting more hybrid investments. This is the, the, the area we need to focus a lot. Or, or green hydrogen, this sort of kind of uh, technologies what, that we will need to cover the, the intermediacy of renewables. And uh, Georgos, I just want to ask you also very briefly, uh, more or less the question that I was asking Adam before, in terms of, of actually uh, speaking with the workers, preparing them for the just transition, uh, you know, what's, 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 uh, what's that experience like on the, on the company side? 
Well, I think the company has passed, as I said, a, a decade of um, sort of stagnation. Uh, and the local GDP on that region was dropping uh, on a year-by-year -year basis. Uh, and, uh, of course, also the people felt that um, uh, degradation as well in their in their economics, I mean, the, the, the inhabitants of the areas. So when we came with our plan to, 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 to do the transition faster and remove everything by 2023, it was like a common secret that had to be, had to be spoken and, and realized. So people accepted it uh, fairly well. Our workers are closer to retirement, to, to be frank, and uh, um, uh, they will, I mean, we will remove the assets, most of them will go in retirement, um, and, and uh, younger people we will retrain to, to the new economy, and uh, we are working a lot also with the government for other industries, uh, retrainment and, re and uh, reskilling. So, you know, moving in this transition and delivering and, and creating and designing new projects that I spoke about, new renewables, new I mean, ways to energy and many other things that we're doing, it brings a lot of excitement as well. I mean, for the first time, there is a plan, as I said, and, and people are waiting for this to be executed. And this gives a visibility of a stability and prosperity. So uh, I cannot say that we didn't have a good reception. We had a very good receptions and everybody is, is moving forward towards uh, the, the common uh, target. All right, well, on that optimistic note, we are out of time. So I, I wanna take this opportunity to thank all of our speakers, Adam, Nicholas, Samantha, Georgos, uh, for what is a really, really uh, spirited debate and certainly one that we will continue having. Hopefully, Nicholas, we won't have to wait seven years to, uh, to, to meet up again to, to discuss this and we can check in every so often to see how it's coming along. Uh, we're going to take a short break now and after that we'll be back for a spotlight discussion on when will the CO2 border tax see the day which will be moderated by my colleague Paola Tama uh, from Political Live. I want to wish you all a very good morning and we'll be back very soon. <laughs>